Good morning. How's everybody today? Man, had it been a great weekend. Awesome. So good to see everybody here today. We have a nice crowd today in class. Thank you so much for coming. We're in the book of Romans. Handouts are available on the on the tables in the hall and the two inside tables if you come in for today's lesson. Feel free to get some of those and then I did have extra copies up here on the front pew. They may have been moved, but we'll we'll make sure you have extra copies if you need some. We're in Romans chapter 12. This is our third lesson on Romans chapter 12. You know, Dale Carnegie says we don't need to be taught as much as we need to be reminded. So I guess we're, <laughs> we're reminding each other of some of the things that Paul is trying to tell us. He starts off with Romans chapter 12 saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So I want to review just a little bit about what we've talked about. You know, that we shared with each other last week. Paul says, I urge you, I beg you, I'm pleading with you to change. I, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. I want you to consecrate. I want you to give your bodies over to a divine purpose. And he says, I'm really begging you to do that. So we're going to spend a little time looking at ways in which we can uh, consecrate ourselves and then um, he, he's talking about uh, in, in verse 2 do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so we're talking about transformation transformation is is to gain a knowledge and change our perspective on the way we look at things so not all are we going to give our bodies over for a divine purpose to be God's children but now we're going to transform our mind. And so what we did last week is, we, you know, we shared the definition of these two terms. We talked about consecration, then we talked about transformation. That's sort of what we want to continue to do today. But then we looked at ways in which we could do this. What are we devoting our body to? Then uh, we, we looked at two ways to measure um, one was our schedule. The other was our financial records. Now, when we talk about managing time and talking about managing money, people have a tendency to think, well, Steve, you need to stop. You're meddling. <laughs> what meddling? What we're trying to keep in mind here is how we've given ourselves over to God. How, how are we managing our time? And then if we're transforming by the renewing of our minds, the complete way of thinking. And so we looked at how does we schedule our time. And if there's 168 hours in a week and we spend a minimum of 40 working, most of us work more than 40 hours. But for the sake of keeping good records, we talked about how we spend 40 hours, and then we looked at the, the rest of the 128, and how do we spend our time? How... Are we giving our time over to a divine purpose? How much time do we spend in that? I hope you've looked at that exercise, and I hope you looked at that closely, because it might reveal <laughs> where we are, and, and we really haven't consecrated our time, nor have we transformed the way that uh, we've renewed our mind. So after we left that, we looked at our finances. And how are we, you know, how are we spending our monies? Um, is it on things that's, you know, that out of necessities? Are we, what is our debt to asset ratio? You know, are, are we a lot in there? Discretionary funds. We go out to eat. We go on vacation. We do this and that. Giving. You know, I talked with some of you this week and, and about last week's lesson. You should, 
I was, it was suggested to me that we should put giving first. Well, I wasn't trying to rank and file. I was, but I see what you're, you're saying because that's the first thing. If, if we were truly transformed and consecrated our thought. Um, and then um, how much money do we waste? So I hope you, you took your outline home last week and you spent some time with this. And it was very helpful. And I hope that we use these two tools to help analyze and to help manage a new way of thinking it, that Paul's trying to get us to see. Then we continued around verse 9 of Romans chapter 12, and we looked at some basic things that Paul was trying to tell us. One was to be humble. And then we looked at love. You know, we think that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a very poetic chapter. It's a very uh, truthful chapter about love. But Romans 12, 9 through 13, is a list of one to one things that helps us renew our minds. And we talked about affection and honor. Not for ourselves, but the honor that I'm to show you. I'm to make you feel good. It's not about making me feel good. The transformation and the renewing our mind is how, what, I'm, what am I doing to honor you, to make you feel better? And enthusiasm and, and the passion that we have Enthusiasm, I, I used to hear Ira North talk, tell about this a lot when I was a young guy, about how contagious enthusiasm, enthusiasm was. And it is. You, know, you, you can walk into a r room with a group of people, and if you're full of life and vigor, you know, you, you're, you're sort of glad that person's in the room. But then if you walk in, you say, how are you doing? And all of a sudden you've got a cloud over you. And <laughs> it's just raining on. How sad. And, it, you know, you wonder, well, I'm so happy when you, I'll be happy when you leave. Well, I, I don't, so we need to have passion and enthusiasm. Patience. Patience was a hard one, wasn't it? Sure is. And then generosity. Just, you know, just helping folks. Um, hospitality, not just hospitality to those you know and those you're close to, but giving hospitality to everyone. Graciousness. And then sympathy. So all of these things that we're talking about in, in verses 9 through 13 has to deal with a new way of thinking, the renewing of our mind giving our bodies over to a divine purpose. And so with, with, with using those two ways to measure, I want us to look at a third way today. How can we measure what Paul's trying to... If, 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 he's, if he's urging and he's pleading and he's begging and he wants us all to change, how can we measure change so we looked at time management we looked at money so today I want us to look at some scripture that uh, Paul uses in chapters 12 13 14 and 15 that parallels to the teaching of Jesus Christ he, he regularly combines doctrine with duty he combines belief with behavior. And so where does he get this? Paul, being an apostle of Jesus Christ, teaches the very words of Jesus Christ. And so I've made in, in this morning in, in the outline that I gave you, um, talking about the teachings of of Jesus. Now, what we have to realize, too, that Paul was such a good student himself. You know, when he was a, a devout Jew, 
before he became a, a Christian, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. And so he knew Scripture. And, and being a Roman citizen, and he, you know, he was a good scholar. So keep that in mind. So today I want us to look at some of the things that Paul wrote for us, and then I want to see the parallel passages of Scriptures that Jesus supplied. So he's just really preaching from our Lord. The first example this morning is found in chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This came from our Lord in Luke chapter 6, verse 28, talking about blessing those to, to, who curse you. Now, this curse is not a, necessarily a profanity-type language. It can be. We're not going to limit it to that. But a curse that we're talking about at this particular time is when um, you're, you're trying to Im imply a curse upon someone to, that it would not be in their well-being. We, we don't want them to be successful. We, we actually prefer pain and and things on those who who persecute you well paul and and jesus both said don't don't do that then in chapter 12 verse 7 if it is serving let him serve if it is teaching let him teach if no i've got the wrong one 17 that should be i need to correct correct that on your handout that's chapter 12 verse 17 not 7 do not repay anyone evil for for evil be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody our lord's teaching on that came from matthew chapter 5 do not resist an evil person then live at peace with everyone verse 18 if it's possible as far as it depends on you again a a transforming thought you know, it's not the way we normally think. But, uh, again, that, he, he's trying to get us to, to have a new way of thinking. And, and of course, we, we think a little bit, well, how are we able to do this? How are we able to make this change? Well, he tells us this at the very beginning. We're only able to do this by the mercies of God. He's helping us. We, we can do this. He, he's confident we can do it because we have the grace of God, the mercies of of God and of course our Lord stated this in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 9 then in chapter 12 verse 20 therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink for in doing so thou shalt reap coals of fire on his head be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And our Lord talks about this again in the book of Luke. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Again, in an entirely different way of thinking because the law that everybody grew up in wanted you to have, a, they misinterpreted that law because we have a tendency to think of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, we want to double up our fist and hit you back. But he's given us a transforming way of thinking. It's completely different. Then, chapter 13, verse 7. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Then our Lord talked about this in the book of Mark. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God what is God. Then Paul states in chapter 13, again, love one another. Um, <clears throat> this comes from John chapter 13, verse 34. It'd be interesting when you read the book of John, every time you read the word or the phrase, love one another, if you underline that and count how many times the apostle of love wrote this in his book. 
chapter 13, verse 8. He who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. And then our, our Lord talked about this in several times, but the, the, the second time there is in Matthew 22, verse 37, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The commandments are summed up in one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Then our Lord talked about doing unto others what you'd have them do to you. Understand the present time is taken from chapter 13 verse 11 and do this understanding the present time the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed our lord our lord talked about this in the 12th chapter of luke and to to share with you what his general thought is here paul's wanting us to live in the light of the day and not in the darkness of the night he's, he's warning us the present time is what like the, the hebrew writer says today is the day of salvation if you harden not your heart so live in the light of the day and not in the darkness of night it it, it has the same thought as to waking a sleeping child you know how hard it is to wake a sleeping child sometimes you just can't get them awake well, that's, that's the implication that our Lord and Paul's both saying to us. Sometimes it's hard for us to wake up, open our eyes to the, to the light of the day. <clears throat> then in chapter 13, verse 11, And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we had first believed. Wake up from your heavy sleep. Do not let him find you sleeping. It's found in the book of Mark. And then in Luke, your redemption is drawing near. So the time is now. In chapter 14 and verse 10, you then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. And then our Lord talks about in Matthew 7 1, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For what measure you judge, that will be judged back to you. We're all familiar with that. Then Paul says, each of us will give account of himself to God. In chapter 14, verse 12, our Lord said this in Matthew 12, verse 36. We'll have to give account for ourselves on the day of judgment. And then in chapter 14, verse 13, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind. Again, a transformation, the the change. Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Uh, From the NEB translation, alas for the world that such causes of stumbling arise. In chapter 14, verse 14, he talks about no food is unclean in and of itself anymore. All food is clean. Uh, Jesus talked about this uh, in Matthew and in Mark. In chapter 14, verse 17, 
For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Matthew chapter 6. We're all familiar with, with that teaching at the end. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So, now, um, after, after looking at this analysis and this way of um, measuring, Paul's wanting us to transform, consecrate our lives, and so that was a third example of how we can do this. We can look at the teachings of Jesus Christ through the voice of Paul. And Paul was writing this to the church at Rome and to us today. And so we can parallel his teachings. And it's a way that we, a third way in which we can measure and transform our lives. So now, um, I sort of want us to look at a test. It's a test that I, you know, we, if, it's one that Paul sort of gives us in the 12th chapter. When we backed up and looked at Christianity 101, he's, he's talking about love. Love is sincere. Love is unselfish. Love is realistic. Love is enthusiastic. It's consistent. It's helpful. So now that we have this knowledge, um, we have this mindset of, of being a Christian and, and being a good Christian because we have transformed our lives. I heard a story one time about this little boy, you, you know, he, he would come to church and he'd hear the guy, the minister or the teacher stand up and talk about being a Christian, being a Christian, being a Christian. And finally the little boy says, well, Dad, you know, what, what is a Christian? And so he thought about it for a minute, and he answered his little boy, and he said, well, you know, being a Christian, is, it's a certain kind of life. It's, uh, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, I've been studying Romans chapter 12. He said, I have a list here, and, and I can go over the list for you. A Christian is loving, he's unselfish, he's enthusiastic, he's consistent, he's helpful, he's gracious, he's sympathetic, and he's humble. That's the eight things that we talked about in Christianity 101, and the boy thought about his father's words for quite some time, and he says to his dad, to his dad well, have I ever met one? Well, so that's the test. We, we've been told what to do. He shares with us about living in harmony. In, in verse 16, he says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. It's, it's a test that we've, we're all having to take. And I'm not good at taking tests, you know. And I, you know, I didn't know when I left Auburn that tests were harder <laughs> I mean, well they are absolutely and y you know when I when I went back to school at Abilene I met two great guys one was east east Tennessee and the other one was from North Carolina and after the third year of school we found out that we all like to fly fish, and so we decided that we'd meet in the Smoky Mountains because it was about halfway from me and halfway from the guy that lived in North Carolina, and we met in the Smoky Mountains, and we'd fish for three days, and we'd be gone two nights kind of thing, and, and we decided that we would fish every branch in the Smoky Mountain for trout, and we soon ran out of places that we could drive to in our car, so we being adventuresome kind of guys we decided we'd pack in so we loaded our gear and and we made several trips packing into the smoky mountains and fishing and, and it was just an awesome time 
Uh, it, it was just amazing, the things that we saw and how beautiful it was in the fall. And so when I would come out and come home, I would try to find a congregation that I could worship on Sunday evening. And so the first t time I came home, um, I stopped at a congregation in Knoxville. Now, you can imagine how rough I looked. You know, I'd been, I'd been in, the, in the woods for three or four days, and um, I didn't sit close to anybody. But when I came in, everybody looked at me pretty hard. And I'm thinking, well, what's this? And then I realized, well, how, how rough do you look, Steve? And, and, and so I can just see them thinking, he needs help with his light bill. <laughs> he he's come in he wants a hotel room you, you know i'm I just you know, i was just grinning to myself thinking because I, i'm guilty of this you, 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 uh, of people coming here at times and 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 they they look a little rough they, they're not dressed in their uniform right and so i, it, I immediately i'm not of the same mind that these people are and i'm not associating with these people that are lowly. And, and I, I never will forget sitting in that congregation. People would sort of turn around like this and, 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 and look at me. And then the worship would start and we'd begin to sing. Of course, I knew the words and I just started singing. And now they're looking at me again going, oh, man, maybe we can help him more than his light bill because this guy knows the words of the song. He said, <laughs> you know, and then, of course, after service is over, they come up and shake your hand. They didn't beforehand. And ask where I was from, and I told them what I was doing, and, you know, it sort of pleased them. So the, nec the next year, we went on the same trip, and the same thing. I thought, well, on my way home, I'll stop at a congregation. So this time, I sort of went through the country, and I came through Lafayette, Tennessee, so I had challenged myself to see if the same thing would happen. So I walked in that congregation and sat down. Well, they looked like me. You know what I'm saying? They had on the blue jeans and the flannel shirt and hadn't shaved in several days. And, you know, so they, they didn't look at me like I needed help with my light bill. And they immediately came to me and welcomed me and shook my hand and, and, and so forth. And, and so I learned a lesson. With all, and, and Paul's trying to, to tell us here to be transformed, be of the same mind one toward another. Do not be haughty in mind. Associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Again, it's a test. He's challenging us. And, and you know, Christianity is a great equalizer. It truly is. And, and he, so he starts out talking about how to love the unlovable. I mean, things were going good for us till he got there, right? But he doesn't waste any time. How do you love the unlovable? He says, bless those who persecute you and bless not. So then he talks about four negative things. Um, they're very similar, but he says it four times. The first thing, do not curse. Don't wish harm on the people that are hurting you. Now, the persecution that Paul's talking about is, is different from some of the persecution we think we have where somebody's hurt our feelings and we're pouting and we're not speaking and the, the people actually were persecuting the, the church there a little bit tougher than what we're at but I think it applies to us today I think we can use the same thing today so when he's telling the church there to be transformed in this new way of thinking and if you've been persecuted by some folks don't curse those. Don't wish harm on them. Then he says, don't pay back evil for evil. 
And again, a devout Jew could easily recall that misused passage of Scripture, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Then he says, never take your own revenge. Come on now, I want to. It's easy to do. Then, do not be overcome by evil. So that's four negatives. But you know Paul, he's going to have a balanced equation, right? He's not going to leave us with a negative. So then he lists for us some positive things. Bless your enemies. Look at verse 14 in chapter 12. Bless those who persecute you, negative. Bless and do not curse. Bless your enemies. Bless your enemies. Be transformed. I urge you. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you. Change your, your mindset. Change your mind. Do what's right and strive to be at peace with all men. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Leave the matter of revenge in God's hand. We just read that. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Overcome evil with good that's what he says in verse 21 so this is a test for us isn't it pretty hard one pretty hard one to pass so he he, he explains to us how i mean it, this is hard it's not so easy so he helps us and shows us how to love the unlovable. First thing we do is we pray. You know, in verse 14, bless. Bless means that we're asking God to bless them. We're, it's a prayer thing. We're, we're wanting... Um, We're wanting God to bless them. I, I, I heard a story one time about this man, and he, he came to church, and he noticed several people around him were always happy, and he always had a, a, a mad countenance, a sad countenance. And so he goes to the preacher, and he talks to him and says, you know, I notice these people are happy. I can't seem to be where they are in, in my Christianity. And he said, well, what's your problem? He said, well, I'm upset at my competitors. And he said, well, I could tell you what to do, but you won't do it. I can tell you how to be happy, but you won't even consider it. So really, there's no need in us talking about this. And he goes, please, please tell me. I want to be happy. And he said, well, you pray for them. He said, you got to be kidding me. He said, no, I need you to pray for them. He says, you mean I, I got to pray for them and actually love them? He said, well, you want to be happy, don't you? I'm telling you. So he said, all right, I, I, I set myself up for this. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to pray for them. So he goes home and he prays for his competitors. And when he got through praying, he goes, now, Lord, you know, I don't really mean this. <laughs> you ever find yourself doing that? I mean, here's the test. We're praying for blessings. We've asked for blessings. But Lord, you know I don't really mean that. So the next day he prays. And the next day he prays. And the next day he prays. And finally it hit him. And he said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I mean it. And he found happiness. And so he comes back to the preacher and he says, you're exactly right. I understand now what you're trying 
to tell me. It, it's, a, it's a test that was so hard. And I, I'm happy now. Thank you so much for sharing it. So, and then, try to get along with him. That, that's difficult too. But yet, he says, by the, I urge you by the renewing of your mind. What's, what's the renewing means? Never pay back evil to anyone. Never. Just get along. He says, if possible, as far as it depends on you. You. Me. Be at peace with men. Then, help him. Paul says to help those who try to hurt us. And yet we go down the road and we see bumper stickers on the back of the cars that said, I don't get mad, I get even. Right? That's what the world says. And, and if we're going to have a transformation by the renewing of our minds, we've got to think in the opposite of that. We, we don't do the eye for the eye, tooth for the tooth thing. It just does not work. And then he says... Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. How much easier it would be if we just turned things over to God. Judgment belongs to God. God said, vengeance is mine. It, it's mine. Leave it alone. Let me do it. You don't know how to do it. Let me do it. He, he shares that. And then... To beat all that, he goes on and says, you know, if, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Mm. Again, it's a transformation. And it's a way that we can use. It, it, it's very analytical. We can measure what we're doing if we do these things. Now, we might ask ourselves, will doing good to my enemies always lead them to repentance and will it always lead to reconciliation? No, it won't. Sorry, to, I mean, it just won't. So don't be disappointed. But on the end, God's, God's going to judge. God's going to be in charge. But you know, sometimes it does have a positive effect. And sometimes it's good to stand up here and tell the story of what's happened. And we need to hear that. We do need to hear positive things, but don't expect it every time because more than likely it's just not, not going to happen. So this is a very difficult test. Um, I, I, I have just enjoyed Romans chapter 12, and I hope it transforms our lives. Thank you so much.